Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And here's the, where we find the title of tonight's message in verse number two, looking unto Jesus. If you're looking any other place, you're looking in the wrong place. Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He's been writing your story. He is writing your story, and he will finish it. No one enters into this race without a, a possibility of finish, without the path for success, and he will finish that good work that he started in each and every one of us. He alone holds the pen that writes the narrative. And he's prepared tonight to, to start the next chapter in your life and in my life and in our lives collectively. Would you put your Bibles down one more time and would you clap your hands and would you raise your voice and would you thank the Lord, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus, we're so grateful tonight to be a part of your kingdom this great group of believers that has assembled here tonight in anticipation of what you're going to do, God. Let your perfect will be done in this place. And everyone said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Again, I just, I feel the energy in the, the room tonight, and it's not man-made. It's supernatural. We are sitting in heavenly places already. As we, as we look to the history of the church, as we consider the things that have come before us, um, history can teach us a few things, amen? Winston Churchill once said, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. You know, the, the, there's, a, there's a saying, history is often written by the victor, and so what version of history are you looking at? And when we look at the Bible, we know that we're looking at the history according to the victor. That's Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Tonight, I feel compelled to build a foundation on the lessons that the church has learned from our history. We have the goal here tonight not to, to have to relearn old lessons, hoping to build on past successes, try not to repeat past failures. While this may be a revelation to, for some, the church at large has never been perfect. Because in order for there to be a church, by definition, the church, the body of Christ, includes people. And wherever there are people, there's struggles, there's missteps, there's mistakes, and yes, even time failure, sometimes failure. But I'm so glad that God is so good at being God, that he can use even our failures to build in us his greatest victories. He's so good at what he does, he can use our shortcomings to see his will to come to pass. I don't know how he does it, but he does nonetheless. And he's given us an ability to learn from our past and from those past experiences captured within the word of God, both the good and the bad, the successes and the failures, he has not hid it from our sight. Throughout the Bible, God has given us examples of other people's victories and other people's missteps and mistakes, all for our benefit. So do we have to be doomed to repeat the past Tonight, over the next several hours, I want to share with you the history of the church. <laughs> what, somebody told me we had till midnight. <laughs> no? Oh, that wasn't for me? That was for you? You had till midnight? All right. I guess I'll have, we'll have to go with the abridged version. Spoiler alert, throughout the history of the church, the church makes as many mistakes as we have victories. It's in our nature, we're, we're human. And apparently it's by God's design that we are in need of a savior, in need of a supreme deity. Historians estimate that somewhere around 100 AD, plus or minus 10 years, those men who walked with Jesus, the disciples walked no more being in the grave. And it's within this time frame that history would show a record of distinctive doctrines splintering off from the church that was born in Acts chapter 2. Between the year 90 
and 140 AD, history shows four distinct groups or denominations that came to be. The Ebonites were a Jewish Christians who continued to hold on to their Jewish heritage and culture, and so much so that it affected their understanding and application of this New Testament gospel. They, they started to change, but weren't able to let go of the past in order to grab a hold of the future. The Old and the New Testament commingled together doesn't work so well. The law and the New Testament that fulfills the law didn't settle well in their stomachs. The Gnostic movement was a fast-growing movement in the second century, having combined elements of Christianity with Oriental religion and Greek philosophy. Their name by meaning is knowledge, and they believed that the understanding of salvation was knowledge that could only come from a higher power, and their concepts of higher enlightenment being very similar to those taught in some Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism today. The Marcion group began with a man named Marcion, similar to the Gnostics, but different in that they believed that God was composed of two entities. See, there were, they believed there was this evil God who created the world and gave the law of the Old Testament, and then there was this good God who came to fix the mess that the evil God created. Marcoon taught that the f faith in Jesus Christ, the higher God, was for salvation, and that they practiced water baptism in the name of Jesus because of that, but they did not believe that Jesus was the God of the Old Testament, thus they broke off from the mainstream, forming yet another denomination. Over these first hundred years of Christianity, there was a fourth group that stands alone from the other three, having separated themselves from the mainstream. The Montanism group of believers, named after a presbyter named Montanus, this group is unique because their separation from the mainstream was not a, a deviation from the scriptures. In fact, their notoriety was based on the emphasis that they put on personal holiness. As they felt like the mainstream of this New Testament church, a hundred years after the disciples walked on this earth, was embracing worldliness and departing from the doctrine. They, they put a major emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit, and they accused the mainstream of marginalizing the miraculous gifts, such as prophecy and speaking in tongues, and this presbyter named Monteus was very outspoken about the structure of the church. He preached for a deconstructed church in a way where every believer themselves was a high priest endued with power, amen? And while they stood for biblical truths that set them apart in a direction much closer to ourselves today, Eventually, that same group became extremists, or at least some of them did, punishing their own bodies and seeking the favor of God through works that went way beyond the, bond, the bounds of Scripture, leading to a form of legalism. They believed in the one God named Jesus, and even with full truth, as mankind tries to interpret things in his own ability, even those once saved by grace can move to a system of saved by works. Today, here, the Church of Racine, in the year of our Lord, 2023, we can learn from the past, careful not to allow ourselves to add to or take away from the scriptures. Because history will show that even Bible fundamentalists like ourselves can go astray. In Brother Bernard's book entitled The History of Christian Doctrine, he describes a, a circular pattern of church history. Similar to what happened in the epistles in the years immediately after the time of the disciples' ministry on earth, this circular pattern in church history starts with a great burst of spirit-filled revelation and numerical growth. It's followed by a, a falling away into a false doctrine, that, and as time goes on, a proliferation of that false doctrine then takes center stage, and then God looks for an individual to help to restore what was once lost. And as we look at the past, as we look at the first and second centuries, the historical records would indicate by 300 AD, no quantifiable mass of people seemingly had a real experience with God like they had at the beginning. 300 years later, the, the church that was born on Pentecost no longer had an identifiable mailing address. That isn't to say that there wasn't anyone with this truth that we hold dear, but Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, on this rock I will build my church, speaking of the revelation of the mighty God in Christ. And the word of God says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against that. So as a matter of faith in the word of God, we can affirm that God has always had a people, but history would tell us that for thousands of years there was no record of them. Thinking again about this circular pattern of church history, as you, as you draw a circle, you leave the part which you started, and then as the circle continues to go initially, eventually it, it gets closer to where it, it started. It's a circle, a virtuous circle or a vicious circle. As history does show this pattern of God restoring this truth that we hold today, step by step, God gives a revelation to an individual, and then that sparks a fire inside of them, and that fire starts to grow until it forms a movement, and then that movement organizes. 
But eventually mankind gets comfortable in his ways and while God is still wanting to move the line forward as he's still trying to advance, moving closer to the truth that we hold dear one step at a time, mankind wants to somewhere along the way stay where they're at. You know, when somebody asks you what church you attend, what they're really asking you is what denomination are you a part of or what, what group do you affiliate with? I know we talk about denominations, but there really is no such thing as denominations according to the Bible. Reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, There's one body and one spirit, and as you're called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through you all and in you all. As we follow this circular pattern that God has, we've seen through mankind as God works to restore truth, we can see every major denomination within Christianity start out from some new experience or understanding. And those revelations that were anointed of God always move man closer to the starting point, closer to truth, closer to what took place in the upper room. To give you some specifics, we pick up the timeline in the year 1517. A priest and scholar named Martin Luther nails a piece of paper to the door of a Roman Catholic church in Wittenberg, Germany. The paper he left nailed to the door contained 95 revolutionary opinions that would begin what we know as the Protestant Reformation. He proclaimed that repentance is not just confession of one's sins to a clergy, because only God can forgive sin. And that repentance without a change in action is not repentance at all. You can't just say, I repent, and then go back and do the same thing that you just repented of. He was right. And that piece of paper, those proclamations that he nailed to that Roman Catholic Church paved the way for the Protestant faith to come into existence as they were in protest of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. Next in church history, it was the year 1609 as a group of Puritan separatists in the Church of England started to read the Bible in their own language. And you know what? They believed it. And they sought to live it by its every word. And as their faith and understanding grew, they formed congregations separate from the the group that they were affiliated with, which in themselves only accepted like-minded believers in their membership, and they baptized converts, immersing them in water upon profession of their faith. God is restoring truth one step at a time. Their, their opponents nicknamed them the Baptist, and the name kind of stuck, didn't it? The Quakers came into existence around 1640 as George Fox, then a young man, left his home in the English Midlands and traveled around the country on a spiritual quest of his own. It was a time of religious turmoil in England, and people were seeking reform within the Church of England and starting their own competing churches. And over the course of his journey, Fox met others searching for more direct spiritual experiences. He came to believe that the presence of God was found within people rather than in a building. He experienced what he referred to as openings or instances in which he felt God was talking to him directly. Members of the fellowship were informally known as Quakers because they were said to tremble in the way of the Lord. A hundred years later, in 1738, it was John Wesley and others who met regularly for Bible studies and prayer to, to receive communion and to do acts of charity, to, to live out this faith that they read in the Bible. And it was during this time that he wrote about a profound spiritual experience he had saying, I felt my heart strangely warmed as I did trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation an experience that caused John Wesley to challenge the religious assumptions of that day, which resulted in a separation from the Church of England, and the group became known as a holy club or Methodist because of their methodical way in which they carried out their Christian faith. John Wesley later used the term Methodist himself to mean a methodical pursuit of biblical holiness. Sixty years after that pursuit of holiness, it produced what became known as the Holiness Movement. In the 1800s, it was largely made up of Protestants and Methodists, but this holiness movement proclaimed a second blessing or a second experience of sanctification. They professed that we ought to live lives that are separate from worldly values and we ought to adhere to practical holiness in everyday life, not just on some days. In 1868, the movement gained momentum as the National Holiness Association attracted over 20,000 people to Mannheim, Pennsylvania for what was a holiness camp meeting where many said they experienced a powerful Pentecost. Many of those believers went on to become holiness church congregations, and they made salvation, sanctification, healing, and the second coming of Christ their focus. They became known as camp meeting churches, 
because of their freedom to worship in the same style of the holiness camp meetings that they were born out of. Keeping in mind that there is no such thing as the denomination within the scriptures, the Bible only prescribes the concept of a single body, being the body of Christ, the church, and the scriptures only offer differentiation of churches based on their geography, not a brand name. For example, we have the church of Corinth and the church of Ephesus identifying themselves relative to a city, not a doctrine. But today we can look around and there's thousands of religious brands and denominations. So what is a denomination? By definition, a denomination is a group of like-minded people for the sake of progressing their like-mindedness. They, they form a group that can pool their resources to further the proliferation of their beliefs. This church that we're in tonight is associated with a denomination. We are part of the United Pentecostal Church International, but the UPCI is not the one faith that we read about in Ephesians chapter 4. No, that truth isn't limited to a single group or single denomination or a single brand of Christianity because God doesn't need a brand, to na a brand name to do what he does best. He just needs some willing people. People who will go against the norm of their day, who will reach for more of him through the power of his word and the power of his spirit. You and I shouldn't be so worried about what brand of Christianity we are wearing because God isn't into brand names except his own. Like we read in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, And now, why tarryest, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the only brand name that matters, the Lord Jesus Christ. What we should really be focused on is the supernatural power of God, a power that can transform lives of regular, ordinary, everyday people into something extraordinary. So one might still wonder, where did this group of like-minded people come from that formed the UPCI, the United Pentecostal Church International? To answer that question, we, we need to go back in history before the turn of the 19th century. Tonight I'm, I'm reading to you excerpts about Charles Parham from the book entitled Early Pentecostal Revival. Pastor alluded to it already tonight. It was in the late 1800s that Charles Parham was born in Iowa, having been raised in a congregational church. At the age of nine, he felt a call to the ministry. In his teenage years, he found himself part of a Methodist church, and at age 19, he enrolled in college to prepare for that call to ministry. And by 19, or 1894, he broke away from the Methodist church, developing uh, a desire to have fellowship with the brethren of the emerging holiness movement. And it was in Topeka, Kansas that Parham opened the Bethel Divine Healing Home, where he preached and taught with a focus on the gift of divine healing. His quest for more knowledge in the ways of holiness, through it he traveled across the country and, and spent time with various holiness groups, enthralled with the experience that he had witnessed. And it was in the year 1900 he returned to Topeka, Kansas, and after a time of much prayer and fasting, Parham was miraculously offered to take over a large stone structure on the outskirts of Topeka, Kansas called Stone's Folly. Stone's Folly was modeled after a castle, so much so that it had two large pillars that stood out above, a full story above the highest room in the building. It was here that Parham moved his mission from the Bethel House with the goal to create a spiritual atmosphere for the development of an effective witness for Christ. It was here that he opened Bethel College and Bible School the school wasn't accredited by any organization, but they didn't charge any tuition either, so I guess accreditation didn't matter. To enroll, students were only required to sell all of their possessions and believe that God would provide whatever they need. The campus was a kind of communal setting with individuals that would take turns milking their two cows and cleaning clothes and preparing meals, and research suggests that the only textbook for the school was the Bible. As students were given a topic to study coupled with prayer, they would then discuss the word of God, what God had revealed to them for whatever that given subject was. And during these studies, much emphasis was put on prayer for guidance and inspiration. And so these times of prayer would most often take place in one of the two towers. And so much so that there was continuous prayer offered up in this place. And one of those two towers as individuals volunteered for three-hour prayer vigils, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. A sacrifice of prayer was continually being made in one of those towers at Stone's Folly. Over the course of that first year, Parham and his students would try to unravel biblical questions regarding the supernatural power of God. And during this time, one of Parham's areas of concerns was found in the book of Acts, chapter 2. It was in December of that year, 1900. One of Parham, as, he, or as Parham prepared to depart for a series of meetings, he told his students, I believe that our experience should 
tally or be the same as what is in the second chapter of Acts and that what others preach is the proof of the baptism of the Holy Ghost does not line up with the experience of the New Testament church and he gave them the task to pray and study and to read and ask God for divine direction and inspiration. Days later upon his return on December 31st and New Year's Eve like today, he met with his students and he asked them what, what had they derived in his absence and he was amazed as each of them individually replayed the same story. They said the common denominator of the 120 in the upper room was that they all spoke with other tongues as the biblical evidence of a genuine baptism in the spirit. And upon the profession of their faith in the word of God, they as a group charted a course that they all hoped would lead them to that same experience, praying and seeking God even now more earnestly with an expectation for what to come. And similar to this service here tonight, that marks the doorway this New Year's Eve from one year to the next, it was on January 1st, 1901, that God rewarded their faith. As the students prayed, there was one student in particular, Agnes Osmond, who approached Brother Parham and asked if he would place his hand on her head like she had read the apostles had done in the book of Acts. No sooner had he laid his hands on her head, she began to speak with syllables that neither of them understood as she was speaking in tongues, a language she never learned. During the days and weeks that followed, more of the students and Parham himself all had the same experience. One after another, they spoke in a language they never learned. In the months that followed the outpouring of God's spirit in this strange building, Stone's Folly on the edge of Topeka, Kansas, Bethel College would then seek to share this experience, this amazing power and majesty of God's spirit with a world that wasn't ready to accept it, weren't ready to adopt something so new and so different, so foreign. And again, here we can see the cycle of how the religious establishment would rather hold on to tradition than to embrace the full blessings of God's truth. It was in that same year of 1900 when the owner of the property of Stone's Folly sold it out from under Parham to a known criminal group who turned Stone's Folly into a house of ill repute. Shortly thereafter, the transition of ownership, the house burned down to the ground. It was said that God was not going to allow a house that was so consecrated a stone's folly to become a, a home for sin. Now without a place to call home, Parham and his students didn't stop there. They, they relocated Bethel several times, eventually settling in Houston, Texas. Years later, their relocation would produce another important intersection in church history because it was at this school in Texas that W.J. Seymour, a black preacher, blind in one eye, picked up this truth and carried it to Los Angeles where it erupted into what became the Azusa Street Revival. In 1906, in the streets of Los Angeles, the Azusa Street Revival was a tipping point. It still is a tipping point for the greatest modern-day outpouring of the Holy Ghost in church history. It was the beginning of a revival that's still going on today, turning traditional Christianity on its head as people experience the power of being born of the water and born of the Spirit. It's from Frank Bartleman's personal diary and regular reports in holiness publications during that time that we have the most complete record and reliable source for what actually happened in Los Angeles from that time period of 1906 to 1909. Frank Bartleman was quoted saying, very opposite of Winston Churchill, but in the same vein, history does repeat itself as revival almost always begun, begins among the laity. In other words, history of true revival starts with people without title or position. Church, true revival doesn't often come from the top down. Rather, it starts from the bottom up. Because revival is not about an organization. Revival is about individuals. Even God manifests in the flesh chose fishermen, tax collectors, and tradesmen who had no degrees, no titles, no positions, or leadership in the community to become his disciples. So even from the beginning, God has chosen ordinary people who were hungry for something more, even if they didn't know what more was exactly yet. And then through their hunger, God reveals himself to them in truth. And that revelation causes a, a spiritual uprising and displaces tradition that isn't ready and willing to go past what they know and what they have. That pattern is as old as time itself, repeating it over and over and over again. At some level, Jesus himself established it the pattern when he brought us the plan of salvation, a plan that went against everything that he had to, was established of religion in that day. Tonight, in closing, 
I would call your attention once again to our opening text in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Tonight you've heard evidence of a great cloud of witnesses that speak of God's desire to give revelation to those who are hungry. Those who are willing. Wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight of sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Every one of our prayers this year should say something like, Lord, this year, new year I want to let go of the things that are keeping me from taking that next step so that you can write the next chapter that is my life in you. Tonight, as we, we prepare to cross the threshold between two years, we, we do it building on the past, not going, repeating things that, that have happened, but building on them, going back to the basics even. Finding a revival within ourselves, not waiting for someone else to produce it for us. Seeking God for what only God can do through our individual sacrifices. Tonight, as the musicians come on this New Year's Eve, we, we take communion to mark a, it's a key milestone. Let me ask you a question. Do you think it was a coincidence that it was on the eve of the New Year that God poured out his spirit in Topeka, Kansas, like he did in the upper room in Jerusalem? It is not a coincidence. No, there are no coincidences in the kingdom of God. Similarly, there, it is no coincidence that you are here in this place on this New Year's Eve. God has always had a very specific calendar and order of events. He's, he's never been sloppy or disorganized. Precision in everything that he does. And throughout the Old Testament, we can read the, about the many feasts that God ordained, each feast having a very specific time on the calendar for God's people to celebrate in obedience to his word. There was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was the, to start the day after Passover, which represented God's deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt. In like manner, we put into remembrance God's deliverance of us from the bondage and the penalty of our sins through the innocent blood that was shed on the cross. And like our Jewish brethren, who still to this day observe Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, tonight we observe communion as we cross the threshold between the old and the new. We remember the blood and we sweep the house clean that is this temple. You see, for that, that whole week of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's unleavened because the, the yeast or the leaven represents sin and so they have to clean the whole house. They have to make sure there is no leaven anywhere. And they, the only bread they eat is the, the unleavened bread. We're gonna do the same thing tonight as we break the bread. They sweep the house that is this, and we sweep this house that is this temple, the temple made without hands. We sweep it in repentance. We purge ourselves in obedience to the word of God, which is simple words spoken and a, a direction or a change in path, in path in our course. We, in doing so, turn the page and offer God a, a blank canvas so that he can write the next chapter. Reading now from Matthew chapter 26, verse 17, it says, Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat Passover? Jesus observed Passover. He's a Jew. And he, Jesus, said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand, and I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Of all the dates on God's calendar, of all the feasts that Israel observed and were commanded to observe, Passover was the most prominent, it was the most important. Passover being a, a vivid illustration of what took place in Egypt with, as each family prepared a sacrifice and they, as pastor said, applied the blood to the doors. They prepared a meal for the family and they were to eat the Passover with an anticipation of deliverance. Tonight we take communion with an anticipation of deliverance. Exodus 12 and 1 says, And thus ye shall eat it with your loins girded and your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. 
communion like Passover is to be eaten or partaken or participated in with the anticipation of deliverance. As a church family, as the body of Christ, we come together tonight to reapply the blood to this house, to this temple, to drink the cup of the fruit of the vine, and then we like the Israelites eat of the unleavened bread and we put into remembrance the body that was broken in anticipation of the gift of salvation that God has granted us with their shoes on our feet and a staff in our hand. We're preparing for the eternal redemption that is to come and is ever growing more quickly and sooner. But before we take communion tonight, I want to answer some frequent questions about who can partake in communion. I want you to know that you don't have to have been born again to partake in communion tonight. You don't have to have been baptized or filled with the Holy Ghost. Certainly the apostles had not been filled yet when they partake of communion with Jesus in that last supper. Second, you don't have to even be a member of this church to join us tonight in communion. Tonight may even be your first visit here and we welcome you and we encourage you, even as a visitor or guest, even if it's your first time to participate, to partake, communion's open to everyone. As long as you're old enough to hold a cup steady and follow instructions, you're old enough to take communion. The only real requirement is that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that you, like us, have a desire to be obedient to his word. And his word instructs us to observe communion like we're going to do here tonight. So in preparation for communion, before we all partake, everyone should have received one of those little cups. I'm going to grab one. If you didn't receive one, uh, we've got some up here and there's some on the back table. Um, now would be a good time to grab one. The communion elements we need to prepare. But before we take communion, we need to clean the house. And so why don't we all stand tonight? And for the next few minutes, as the musicians play, each and every one of us needs to take the broom and, and do a little sweeping. Repentance is not a one-time thing, it's an all-the-time thing. So for the next few minutes, could we just all individually take a moment to reflect, to talk to God, to, to thank Him for what He has done, and to ask Him to forgive those things that we know we need to have forgiveness in our lives, to repent, to turn around, to decide in our minds that we're going to go in a different direction, away from the things that we know displease God and towards the things that we know please God. I don't know how God does it, but he, he, I know that through obedience, he does. If we simply confess to him, he, he renews us, he cleanses us. And now that we've repented, now that we've been cleansed, we, we're prepared to take, partake of the elements. And so if you have your cup, if you turn it so that the cracker side is facing up, and if you take off the seal, and if you would dump the cracker out in your hand and, and hold on to it as we're going to all partake together. Now moms and dads, this would be a good time if your young one may need a little help. Turning the cup over, 
juice side up, removing the seal. If you would hold the elements, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11 and 23. And as I, I read the instructions, I, I will ask you to partake. And then as after we've consumed the communion elements, then we ought to thank the Lord for what he has done for us and what he is going to do for us. And so now reading from 1 Corinthians 11 and 23, it says, for I, have re- for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus that same night in which he was betrayed took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And so now we're all going to eat of that bread in remembrance of the body that was broken for us. Verse 25 says, And after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And so now we all drink of that cup in remembrance of the blood that was shed. For an oft, as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. He's coming back, church. Can we all just raise our hands right now and thank the Lord, the King of Kings, to give honor to the Lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. God, we thank you for the wonderful works that you have done in our lives. God, for this gift of salvation, for this access to truth, God, for putting us in a place where we can have the freedom of worship and liberty to move and to be in your spirit, God. What a privilege it is to be a part of the kingdom of God, to be a part of his family, to have a hope coast beyond this world. At this time, in conclusion of this service and before we open up this altar, I'd like to pray a blessing over all of you and I say a prayer for the food that we're about to eat downstairs. And would you join me in that prayer? Jesus, I I ask that your power and your spirit would be in each and every one of us in this place here tonight, God, that through our obedience, through our participation, through our fulfillment of your word, God, that you would show yourself strong in our behalf, God, that your word would ever become more true in front of us as evidence of your authority in our lives, your hand of protection and provision, God. Lord, let 2023 open up new doors in our walk with you, God, and our commitment to you, God, and that divine spirit that you've promised to engraft into our spirit, God, that we would walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. God, that you would fulfill your destiny in us, that we would become ever more a reflection of you to a dark and dying world. as we open up this altar this area at the end of every service is open and when you come up to the altar it's like telling God I I agree yes Lord I I want to take a step in the right direction and if you've never experienced speaking in tongues a language as the spirit of God God gives the utterance God wants to make tonight your night if you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins the water is warm you can go home free from that weight and If you've already experienced all those things tonight, you ought to thank him one more time while it's still 2022. God, look what you have done. Look what you have made in me. Would you come tonight?